The 8,970th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is letter dated 28 February 2014 from the Permanent Representative of Ukraine to the United Nations addressed to the President of the Security Council, S-2014-136. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Germany and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Item 2 of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Rosemary De Carlo. Thank you. Mr. President, it's with great concern and sadness that I brief the Council this evening on the unfolding dangerous situation in and around Ukraine. In his statement today, the Secretary General was clear. The Secretary General considers the decision of the Russian Federation to recognize the independence of certain areas of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions to be a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and inconsistent with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. We very much regret this decision, which risks having regional and global repercussions. We also regret the order to deploy Russian troops into eastern Ukraine, reportedly on a peacekeeping mission. These developments follow the decision to order a mass evacuation of civilian residents of Donetsk and Luhansk into the Russian Federation. We are concerned by the escalating shelling across the contact line, reportedly leading to a number of casualties. OSCE Special Monitoring Mission has recorded a total of 3,231 ceasefire violations in the Donbass area from 18 to 20 February. 1,073 ceasefire violations, including 926 explosions in the Luhansk region, and 2,158 ceasefire violations, including 1,100 explosions in Donetsk region. Remind, we remind all involved of their responsibilities under international humanitarian law and human rights law. Although the United Nations is not in a position to verify the numerous claims and allegations made by various actors, we are deeply concerned about the reports of civilian casualties, targeting of civilian infrastructure, and ongoing evacuations. Mr. President, we are extremely concerned about the possible implications of the latest developments for the existing negotiation frameworks. Amid the current risks and uncertainty, it is even more important to pursue dialogue. Negotiation is the only way to address the existing differences among the key actors regarding regional security issues and the settlement of the conflict in eastern Ukraine in accordance with Security Council Resolution 2202. Before the current already dangerous conditions escalate further, we call on all relevant actors to focus their efforts on an immediate secession of hostilities. Civilians and civilian infrastructure must be protected, and actions and statements that may worsen the situation must be avoided. Over the past few weeks, key actors have been engaged in intense diplomatic efforts to avert a new eruption of conflict in the heart of Europe. The Secretary General fully supports these efforts and has deplored even the possibility that a new conflict could break out. Mr. President, we are committed to our long-term partnership with Ukraine, a founding member of the United Nations, as it continues to pursue the democratic reform agenda 
30 years after independence. And once again, we reiterate the full commitment of the United Nations to the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders according to General Assembly resolutions. Throughout the eight years of conflict in Eastern Ukraine, the United Nations has continued to provide life-saving humanitarian support to all in need, as well as human rights-related work. During this difficult period, we are committed to stay and deliver and remain fully operational in Ukraine, including in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. The safety and security of our staff must be respected by all parties. Mr. President, the next hours and days will be critical. The risk of major conflict is real and needs to be prevented at all costs. I can assure you of the full commitment of the Secretary General to work toward a diplomatic resolution of the current crisis. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Ms. DiCarlo for her briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the permanent representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Since World War II, the United Nations Charter, the key tenets of which this council is mandated to uphold, has stood as a bulwark to the worst impulses of empires and autocrats. Earlier today, Russia's President Vladimir Putin announced that Russia will recognize as independent states the so-called DPR and LPR regions, the sovereign territory of Ukraine, an area controlled by Russia's proxy since 2014. He has since announced that he will place Russian troops in these regions. He calls them peacekeepers. This is nonsense. We know what they really are. In doing so, he has put before the world a choice. We must meet the moment and we must not look away. History tells us that looking the other way in the face of such hostility will be a far more costly path. Russia's clear attack on Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is unprovoked. It is an attack on Ukraine's status as a UN member state. It violates a basic principle of international law and it defies our charter. What is more, this move by President Putin is clearly the basis for Russia's attempt to create a pretext for a further invasion of Ukraine. The consequences of this action will be felt far beyond Ukraine's borders. We do not have to guess at President Putin's motives. Today, President Putin made a series of outrageous false claims about Ukraine aimed at creating a pretext for war. And immediately thereafter announced Russian troops are entering the Donbass. He claimed that Ukraine is seeking nuclear weapons from the West. This is not true. Ukraine is in fact one of only four countries to have voluntarily surrendered their nuclear weapons. The United States and our allies have no intention of supp supplying nuclear weapons to Ukraine and Ukraine doesn't want them. And then President Putin asserted that Russia today has a rightful claim to all territories, all territories, from the Russian Empire, the same Russian Empire from before the Soviet Union, from over a hundred years ago. That includes all of Ukraine. It includes Finland. It includes Belarus and Georgia and Moldova, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, it includes parts of Poland and Turkey. In essence, Putin wants the world to travel back in time, to a time before the United Nations, to a time when empires rule the world. But the rest of the world has moved forward. It is not 1919. 
It is 2022. The United Nations was founded on the principle of decolonization, not recolonization. And we believe the vast majority of UN member states and the UN Security Council are committed to moving forward, not going back in time. The consequences of Russia's actions will be dire across Ukraine, across Europe, and across the globe. In our past two meetings on Ukraine, I've mentioned nearly three million Ukrainians will need food, shelter, and life-saving assistance right now. The UN estimates the humanitarian toll will expand significantly should Russia further invade. Already Russian proxies dramatically increased shelling and artillery fire over the weekend, killing Ukrainian civilians and soldiers. If Russia invades Ukraine even further, we will see a devastating loss of life, unimaginable suffering. Millions of displaced people will create a refugee crisis across Europe. Nevertheless, Russia has declined repeated entreaties to state its intentions before the world, including by Secretary Blinken in the Security Council last Thursday. Colleagues, President Putin is testing our international system. He is testing our resolve and seeing just how far he can push us all. He wants to demonstrate that through force, he can make a farce of the UN. We must act together in response to this crisis. Over the past few weeks, the world has heard the other 14 members of the Security Council speak with one voice asking Russia to pursue diplomacy. Other members of this council, even those who often align with Russia on other matters, have been clear that the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of every UN member state should be respected and safeguarded, including Ukraine that this is a basic norm of international relations and that it embodies the purpose of the UN Charter. The sequence of events that Secretary Blinken spelled out for this council last Thursday appear to be proceeding exactly as he predicted. Today, President Putin has torn the Minsk Agreement to shreds. We have been clear that we do not believe he will stop at that. In light of President Putin's latest actions, we must all stand up for the principles upon which this organization was founded. President Biden issued an executive order today that will prohibit new investment, trade, and financing in the so-called DPR and LPR regions. Tomorrow, the United States will take further measures to hold Russia accountable for this clear violation of international law and Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. But we and our partners have been clear that there will be a swift and severe response were Russia to further invade Ukraine. In this moment, no one can stand on the sidelines. We must make it clear that an attack on Ukraine is an attack on the sovereignty of every UN member state and the UN Charter, and that it will be met with swift and severe consequences. We continue to believe that the diplomatic table is the only place where responsible nations resolve their differences. That is the only place to preserve peace. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me thank you, G.D. Carlo, for another clear and comprehensive briefing to the Security Council on this issue. Albania condemns in the strongest terms Russia's decision to recognize non-government controlled areas of Ukraine as independent entities. This is a breach of international law, an affront to the UN Charter, another blatant violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and it puts an end to the Minsk agreements. This act of the Russian Federation is null and void, has no basis, and has no international legal validity. 
we call on the Security Council and all the United Nations member states to reject and condemn it firmly. Albania reiterates its firm position in support of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Mr. President, less than a week ago, we were sitting in this very room at the Russian initiative to discuss the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Today, we meet an in, at an emergency meeting exactly because of the Russian Federation decision to violate the very Minsk agreements. This is a disrespect not only to the Council and its decisions, but for the entire universal principles of international law Russia is set to respect and protect. The whole world has witnessed how the Russian Federation has continuously worked to undermine the sovereignty of Ukraine and to determine its geopolitical orientation. What happened today is nothing less but a bis repetita of what we have seen in Georgia in 2008 and with Crimea in 2014, meaning an aggression by fabrication of phantom republics. Who is next? Every UN member state should be alarmed and realize, eyes wide open, the consequences of instrumentalization of national minorities as a weapon to undermine sovereign states, threaten regional and international peace and security. We should not accept the made in Russia model of destabilization be exported to other parts of Europe or anywhere else. We reiterate our demand for the removal of the military troops from the Ukrainian border and from the occupied territories of Ukraine, including troops disguised as peacekeepers when they are simply aggressors. Albania calls on the Russian Federation to stop its fait accompli policy, revoke its illegal decision and engage seriously and in good faith with diplomatic talks and give a chance to the Minsk agreements. Dear colleagues, this is yet another critical moment for Ukraine. The UN should remain actively engaged and committed together with regional organizations to the right of the Ukraine people to live in peace and freedom. We welcome the statement of the Secretary General and echo his call for all relevant actors to prioritize diplomacy to address all issues peacefully as the only way to move forward. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania for his statement. I now give the floor to the permanent representative of France. President, I would like to thank the USG for political and peace building affairs for her statement and I'd also like to thank the Secretary General for his action and for his very clear words. I welcome the presence of Ukraine and France supported their request for an emergency meeting given the extreme gravity of the situation. France condemns Russia's recognition of the separatist eastern regions of Ukraine. This is not just a further attack on the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Ukraine, but it is also a violation of the fundamental principles of the United Nations Charter of Resolution 2202 of this Council, which endorsed the Minsk agreements and the commitments undertaken by Russia, which were confirmed at the very highest level these last few days. On the 17th of February, the Russian representative publicly acknowledged before this Council that there is no alternative to the Minsk agreements and that they were the only internationally recognized legal basis to solve the conflict in Ukraine. But today the reality is quite different. Russia is choosing the path of confrontation in spite of the incessant efforts to achieve a de-escalation over the last few weeks and the last few days, notably by President Macron working with the German Chancellor. We are continuing these efforts and we call on Russia to match its words with its deeds when it claims to be in favor of dialogue and to go back on its decision to recognize the separatist, ent separatist entities. With our European partners, we are preparing targeted sanctions against those who took part in this illegal decision. In the context of the heightened tensions on Ukraine's borders, 
provoked by the strengthening of Russian military activity, we are concerned by this additional step in the destabilization by Russia and by the threat that that weighs on European security. France welcomes the restra restraint that Ukraine has shown in these difficult circumstances. We express our full solidarity with the people and the government of Ukraine. We call on Russia to refrain from any other actions of destabilization, notably those that may undermine the security and the safety of civilian populations and put them in danger. We are particularly concerned by the decision of President Putin to send the army to the separatist territories under the pretext of peacekeeping. This would be another flagrant violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity. President, France will continue to mobilize in support of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Thank you. I thank the representative of France. I now give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking Under Secretary General Rosemary De Carlo for her briefing. We have been closely following the evolving developments relating to Ukraine, including developments along the eastern border of Ukraine and the related announcement by the Russian Federation. The escalation of tension along the border of Ukraine with the Russian Federation is a matter of deep concern. These developments have the potential to undermine peace and security of the region. We call for restraint on all sides. The immediate priority is de-escalation of tensions, taking into account the legitimate security interests of all countries and aimed towards securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. We are convinced that this issue can only be resolved through diplomatic dialogue. We need to give space to the recent initiatives undertaken by parties which seek to dif diffuse tensions. In this context, we welcome the intense efforts underway, including through the trilateral contact group and under the Normandy format. We need parties to exert greater efforts to bridge divergent interests. We cannot afford to have a military escalation. As we have emphasized before, the Minsk agreements provide a basis for a negotiated and peaceful settlement. And we need greater efforts to find common ground to facilitate the implementation of the provisions of the Minsk agreements, including key security and political aspects. As we have time and again emphasized, constructive diplomacy is the need of the hour to avoid scaling up of tensions. The safety and security of civilians are essential. More than 20,000 Indian students and nationals live and study in different parts of Ukraine, including in its border areas. The well-being of Indian nationals is a priority to us. In conclusion, we strongly emphasize the vital need for all sides to maintain international peace and security by exercising the utmost restraint and intensifying diplomatic efforts to ensure that a mutually amicable solution is arrived at the earliest. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for his statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Brazil. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me start by thanking USG Rosemary Di Carlo for the updates she has brought to the Council tonight. Mr. President, when this organization was established in 1945, it entrusted the Security Council with the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Tension in and around Ukraine is being aggravated on a daily, indeed hourly, basis, making this habitual quotation from the Charter of extraordinary importance and relevance. We are all aware how critical the situation has become. Brazil is following the latest developments with extreme concern. In the present circumstance, we in this Council, in representation of the international community, 
must reiterate calls for immediate de-escalation and our steadfast commitment in support of political and diplomatic efforts to create the conditions for a peaceful solution to the crisis. The collective security system of the United Nations rests ultimately on the pillar of international law. This, in its turn, rests upon core principles enshrined in the Charter, the sovereign equality and the territorial integrity of member states, the restraint in the use or in the threat of use of force, and the peaceful settlement of disputes. Yet this pillar and principles will not yield results unless legitimate concerns of all parties are taken into consideration and unless there is full respect for the Charter and for existing commitments such as the Minsk agreements. In this vein, we renew our appeal to all concerned parties to maintain dialogue in a spirit of openness, understanding, flexibility and a sense of urgency to find ways for a lasting peace in Ukraine and in the wider region. A first inescapable objective is an immediate ceasefire with a comprehensive disengagement of troops and military equipment on the ground. Such a military disenga disengagement will be an important step to build trust among the parties, to strengthen diplomacy and to seek a sustainable solution for the crisis. We firmly believe that this Council must live up to its core responsibility to help the parties engage in a meaningful and effective dialogue so as to achieve a solution that effectively addresses the security concerns within the region. Make no mistake, at the end of the day, we are talking about the lives of innocent men, women and children on the ground. I thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I thank the representative of Brazil for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative, the uh, permanent representative of the United Kingdom. Mr. President, we meet this evening because earlier today, President Putin announced the Russian Federation's recognition of the independence of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic and issued a decree to send Russian military forces into Ukraine as so-called peacekeepers. Colleagues, the actions Russia has chosen today will have severe and far-reaching consequences. First, to human life. An invasion of Ukraine unleashes the forces of war death and destruction on the people of Ukraine. The humanitarian impact will be terrible on civilians fleeing the fighting. We know that women and children will suffer most. Second, to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a UN member state which is protected and guaranteed by the UN Charter. As the Secretary General said earlier, Russia's decisions are a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and inconsistent with the principles of the UN Charter. Third, to international law. The actions taken today make mockery of the commitments Russia has made through the Budapest Memorandum and the Minsk Agreements, endorsed by Security Council Resolution 2202. In seeking to redraw borders by force, Russia's actions show blatant contempt for international law. The United Kingdom will be announcing new sanctions on Russia in response to its breach of international law and attack on Ukraine's sovereignty 
and territorial integrity. There will be severe economic consequences to its actions. Colleagues, now more than ever, the Council must shoulder its responsibilities for peace and security and defend the principles of the international, the UN Charter. The Council must be united in calling on Russia to de-escalate immediately, in condemning aggression against a sovereign nation and defending the territorial integrity of Ukraine, in calling on Russia to respect its obligations under the Charter to the peaceful resolution of disputes. Russia has brought us to the brink. We urge Russia to step back. I thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for her statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Senor Presidente. President, we are grateful for the briefing by the USG on the current situation in Ukraine. We are following with concern the recent developments in the situation in the east of Ukraine. In these circumstances, it is critical that those actions exacerbating this crisis cease. The Security Council, through Resolution 2202, supported a range of measures as the only way to resolve the situation in the east of Ukraine. This resolution must be respected. Specifically, in this particular case, three fundamental principles of the UN Charter are being violated, refraining from threatening to use or using force in international relations, respect for the territorial integrity and political independence of states, and non-intervention in the internal affairs of states. It is therefore unacceptable that over the last few days, the shellings, explosions, and other ceasefire violations have increased, according to reports from the OSCE monitoring mission. We urge the parties to immediately end these actions. We wish to recall that in this same room a few days ago, Russia made a categorical statement saying that they would not invade Ukraine. We hope that they will comply fully with that statement. Mexico reiterates its commitment to the respect for the sovereignty, political independence, and the territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders pursuant to the United Nations Charter, international law, and the relevant resolutions of the UN Security Council and General Assembly particularly resolutions 2625 and 3314. We once again reiterate our appeal to resume the path of de-escalation, diplomacy and dialogue. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Mexico for her statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Ireland. Thank you, Mr. President, and I also want to thank Under Secretary General De Carlo for her briefing. Mr. President, we meet tonight at a moment of great danger for the people of Ukraine, for peace and security in Europe, and for the international norms and principles that all of us around this table have a responsibility to defend. It's a moment we had hoped to avoid a moment that should have been averted by diplomacy and dialogue. We must respond to it by speaking clearly and honestly about this grave situation and how we can resolve it peacefully. So let me be clear about where we stand. Ireland's commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognised borders is unwavering. Ireland believes in and is fully committed to the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter. These include the sovereign equality and territorial integrity of states. 
Ukraine has the same fundamental right as every other sovereign and independent state to choose its own foreign policy and to ensure the security and defence of its own territory. The commitments we make as members of the UN are binding on every one of us, no exceptions. Mr President, last Thursday, during the meeting organised by the Russian Federation on the Minsk agreements, we heard from Deputy Minister Vershinen that the goal of that meeting was for the Security Council to affirm that there was no alternative to this milestone document. We believe that the Council did just that. Yet now, four days later, President Putin has decided to recognise as independent entities the non-government controlled areas of Donetsk and Luhansk and to order troops into those two regions of Ukraine. This is the second time in less than 10 years that the Russian Federation has violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It is a flagrant violation of international law. In taking this unilateral step, Russia has abandoned the Minsk agreements and cast into doubt all the diplomatic efforts of past weeks. Ireland commends Ukraine for the restraint it has shown in the face of Russia's military build-up at its border and the provocation of the recognition of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Ireland, along with our EU partners, supports a clear and unequivocal response to this violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. The Russian Federation's unilateral actions serve only to further raise tensions. Ireland once again calls for calm, de-escalation and the pursuit of diplomacy. Even if that call has not yet been heard, it's a call worth making again tonight. We need to see sustained and credible moves on the ground toward de-escalation of this crisis. We urge Russia to reverse the recognition, withdraw its military forces, and return to discussions within the Normandy format. Mr. President, all signatories of the Minsk agreements agreed on the need for the OSCE's special monitoring mission safe and secure access to the entire territory of Ukraine. The mandate of the SMM was agreed by all 57 OSCE participating states. At this sensitive time, it is imperative that the SMM be given the full access agreed in its mandate. We commend those who have engaged in dialogue and urge them to redouble their efforts to seek a peaceful resolution to this perilous situation. We owe nothing less to the people of Ukraine. We call on all parties to ensure the protection of civilians, as well as refraining from any actions that would escalate the situation. Mr. President, Ukraine has already endured eight years of bitter conflict with over 14,000 lives lost. The people of Eastern Ukraine in particular have suffered from years of insecurity, humanitarian crisis and human rights violations and abuses. This Council and its members have the responsibility to work to resolve this conflict, rather than yield to a grim new chapter which will inflict further misery on Ukraine and its people. This is the time to show the courage to pull back from the precipice and return to dialogue and diplomacy. Mr President, we all need to demonstrate our faith in the value of diplomacy tonight. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland for her statement. And I give the floor to the permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Mr. President. And at the outset, I'd like to thank Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, for her updates and briefing this evening. Uh, and I'd like to refer to the statement that the UAE delivered in this chamber uh, on 17th February on the same subject. Uh, I'd like to emphasize once again the importance of de-escalation and restraint 
uh, to maintain uh, regional and international security and stability. Uh, we believe now is the time to uh, engage constructively and in good faith to address the current situation and mitigate its impact, of course, on uh, any civilians and civilian infrastructure, and to chart a diplomatic path forward. Uh, Mr. President, the UAE reiterates the importance of dialogue, as others have said, de-escalation, diplomacy, and to continue all efforts to reach a peaceful solution consistent with international law and the Charter of the United Nations, particularly the pr principles of territorial integrity, independence, sovereignty, and good neighborliness, and we believe uh, the Minsk agreements form a good basis for that, uh, and that adherence to these principles is indeed a sustainable uh, pillar of a peaceful pathway uh, forward, and I thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates for her statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Under Secretary General Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing. We meet tonight on the brink of a major conflict in Ukraine. The diplomacy we urged on the 17th of February is failing. The territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine stands breached. The Charter of the United Nations continues to wilt under the relentless assault of the powerful. In one moment, it is invoked with reverence by the very same countries who then turn their backs on it in pursuit of objectives diametrically opposed to international peace and security. In the last two meetings on the situation in Ukraine and the buildup of forces by the Russian Federation, Kenya urged that diplomacy be given a chance. Our cry was not heeded, and more importantly, the Charter's demand for states to settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered has been profoundly undermined. Today, the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine has been effected. Kenya is gravely concerned by the announcement made by the Russian Federation to recognize Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine as independent states. In our considered view, this action and announcement breaches the territorial integrity of, of Ukraine. We do not deny that there may be serious security concerns in these regions, but they cannot justify today's recognition of these regions as independent states, not when there are multiple diplomatic tracks available and underway that have the ability to offer peaceful solutions. Mr. President, This situation echoes our history. Kenya and almost every African country was birthed by the ending of empire. Our borders were not of our own drawing. They were drawn in the distant colonial metropoles of London, Paris, and Lisbon, with no regard for the ancient nations that they cleaved apart. Today, across the border of every single African country live our countrymen with whom we share deep historical, cultural, and linguistic bonds. At independence, had we chosen to pursue states on the basis of ethnic, racial, or religious homogeneity, we would still be waging bloody wars these many decades later. Instead, we agreed that we would settle for the borders that we inherited, but we would still pursue continental political, economic, and legal integration. Rather than form nations that looked ever backwards into history with a dangerous nostalgia, we chose to look forward to a greatness none of our many nations and peoples had ever known. We chose to follow the rules of the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations Charter, not because our borders satisfied us, but because we wanted something greater forged in peace. We believe that all states formed from empires 
that have collapsed or retreated have many peoples in them yearning for integration with peoples in neighboring states. This is normal and understandable. After all, who does not want to be joined to their brethren and to make common purpose with them? However, Kenya rejects such a yearning from being pursued by force. We must complete our recovery from the embers of dead empires in a way that does not plunge us back into new forms of domination and oppression. We rejected irredentism and expansionism on any basis, including racial, ethnic, religious, or cultural factors. We, re we reject it again today. Kenya registers its strong concern and opposition to the recognition of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states. We further strongly condemn the trend in the last few decades of powerful states, including members of this Security Council, breaching international law with little regard. Multilateralism lies on its deathbed tonight. It has been assaulted today as it, as it has been by other powerful states in the recent past. We call on all members to rally behind the Secretary General in asking him to rally us all to the standard that defends multilateralism. We also call on him to bring his good offices to bear to help the concerned parties resolve this situation by peaceful means. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by reaffirming Kenya's respect for the territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of Ghana. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would also begin by, first of all, thanking USG Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing to the Council. Mr. President, the decision by the Russian Federation to recognize the non-government controlled regions of Eastern Ukraine and to send in troops have stunned the world. Ghana deeply regrets the decision of the Russian Federation to turn its back on the Minsk agreements and the dialogue required to address concerns over the implementation of the agreements. When Ghana joined this organization in 1957, we were under no illusions that the international order was perfect. However, we were convinced, and still are, that the principles of sovereign equality of states, which constitute the basis of this organization and our multilateral order, is the veritable foundation for a stable world. We believe that the United Nations represents the best attempt at maintaining peace across the nations, forging relations and cooperation between and among our peoples, and holding forth the prospect of a better tomorrow. It is for this reason that Ghana, like many other members of the organization, has solemnly committed itself to uphold the Charter and international law. We believe that through multilateralism, we can improve cooperation to make the world a better place for its citizens and for generations unborn. Through this organization and our common actions on principles such as self-determination within the context of the United Nations, the countries that existed under colonial rule have been assisted to become sovereign and politically independent states. By its sheer convening power, this organization has set out a pathway for dialogue for all its members regardless of differences in political ideology, and encourage the development and maintenance of friendly relations. By the actions of this organization, the rights of people across the world have become more respected by their governments and their well-being better guaranteed. Mr. President, I will be clear. Ghana supports the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine the borders of which it joined this United Nations as a bona fide member. We do not support any actions that violate Ukraine's sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity. 
By our principles, Ghana does not recognize any entity outside of the clear arrangements that have been established by the Charter and the principles of international law for the recognition of states. As an international community, we have pulled back from many dangerous scenarios when logic and reason have prevailed. And on this occasion, we re-echo the voice of the Coalition of Peace for Restraint by all parties. While the sound of war may be loud, and the, may be loud the voice of peace runs deeper. We urge restraint on all unsettled but accepted situations across the globe and remind member states of the need to protect the collective security mechanism, which requires adherence to the core principles of the Charter and international law. The true test of greatness lies not in one's ability to use power, but in the capacity to constrain its use when that would be an obvious choice by those of a lesser capacity. We hope that within this council, and perhaps outside of it too, we shall find a resolution of the existing situation in Ukraine, and in a manner that does not impair the mechanisms for peace. While Ghana and other African member states have always held that the use of the veto power is anachronistic and counterproductive to the effective workings of our modern arrangements for maintaining global peace and security, that concern has never been rendered more acute than in situations such as the one we now see. Even though it may be enough for many occasions to say that we are against the actions of a member state, that goes against the international norms, on this occasion, we are all required to do more in reaffirming our common commitment to the purposes and principles of the Charter. Besides the immediate cost of instability, all countries, including the most vulnerable in the developing world, may pay a steep price for the actions that destabilize the part of Europe. As we note with great concern reports of the foreign troops being sent across the borders of Ukraine, we reiterate our continuing concern over the situation of the civilian populations in Donetsk and Luhansk. We urge all parties to strictly comply with the tenets of international law. Mr. President, we may be at the precipice, but we have not fallen over. The path of dialogue and diplomacy still remains. We urge the reversal of escalatory actions and also invite the Secretary General to renew his good offices on the situation in the eastern regions of Ukraine in close coordination with the OSCE and all other relevant partners. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Ghana for his statement. I give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Thank you, President. First of all, I would like to thank Ms. DiCarlo for her briefing. President, over the last few weeks, we have regularly been called to monitor the situation on the border between Russia and Ukraine with fears of military action and a ratcheting up of rhetoric by the parties. The call for sovereignty over the separatist regions of Donetsk and Luhansk have sent signals of imminent action. President, today Russia has announced its decision to recognize the sovereignty of the self-declared republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. This decision is heavy with consequence for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, and it also undermines the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Gabon, which is particularly attached to the principles of uh, the territorial integrity and national sovereignty, notes the attack on these essential pillars of international relations. We call on all parties to show restraint and to de-escalate 
and to adhere to the Pacific settlement of disputes in line with the United Nations Charter and encourages them to use dialogue and diplomacy to avoid irreparable damage from the crisis. Thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of Gabon. I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Norway. President, let me also thank U.S. Rosemary Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing and through her, the Secretary General, for today's press statement. We are gathered here this evening because of the Russian Federation's violation of the core principle on which this organization is built, the sovereign equality of all its members. Norway strongly condemns the decision by the Russian president to recognize the self-proclaimed People's Republic of Donetsk and People's Republic of Luhansk in eastern Ukraine as independent states. Recognition of the self-proclaimed People's Republic is a clear violation of the Minsk agreements under which Russia recognizes the non-government control areas in eastern Ukraine as part of Ukraine. The Russian Federation, as signatory of the Minsk agreements and as endorsed by Resolution 2202, 20, has made a clear commitment to seek a peaceful settlement to this conflict. And recognition of the self-proclaimed People's Republics runs directly contrary to the work of the Normandy format and the trilateral contact group towards a negotiated peace. Furthermore, Russia's actions constitute a clear violation of international law. It has chosen unilateral action and military threats rather than diplomacy and dialogue. Norway urges Russia, as a party to the conflict, to fulfill its commitments to abide by international law and to return to the path of diplomacy. Russia's continued massive military buildup in and around Ukraine remains an issue of grave concern. Norway urges Russia to de-escalate by withdrawing its military forces from within Ukraine and from the vicinity of its borders. We commend Ukraine's posture of restraint in the face of continued provocation and destabilization efforts. Russia's decision to deploy forces in eastern Ukraine is unjustified and irresponsible as it further increases tension. We are facing the prospect of a war that would not only threaten Europe's security architecture, but would also lead to unparalleled suffering for the civilian population. Norway calls on Russia to strictly respect and fully adhere to international humanitarian law. We call upon all parties to protect civilians, including humanitarian personnel and civilian infrastructure, and to facilitate safe, rapid, and unhindered humanitarian access to those in need in Ukraine. President, let me conclude by again reiterating Norway's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its international recognized borders. Let me finally recall the principles and purposes of the UN Charter, which are now under threat by the action of the Russian Federation in and around Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of Norway for her statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. China has been paying close attention to the latest developments of the situation in Ukraine. We fully elaborated on our position at the previous two meetings of the Sound Council on this topic. At present, all parties concerned must exercise restraint and avoid any action that may fuel tensions. We welcome and encourage every effort for a diplomatic, diplomatic solution and call on all parties concerned to continue dialogue and consultation and seek reasonable solutions to address each other's concerns on the basis of equality and mutual respect. The current situation in Ukraine is a result of 
many complex factors. China always makes its own position according to the merits of the matter itself. We believe that all countries should solve international disputes by peaceful means in line with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of the Russian Federation. Distinguished colleagues, we've just now heard a number of highly emotional statements, categorical assessments and far-reaching conclusions related to the signing today by Russia's president of decrees recognizing the Lugansk and Donetsk people's republics. I'll lead the direct verbal assaults against us uh, unanswered. Now it's important to focus on how to avoid war and how to force Ukraine to stop the shelling and provocations against Donetsk and Lugansk. From the statements of a number of our colleagues, one may get the impression that Russia's recognition of the LPR and the DPR took place suddenly for no reason at all. Of course, that's not the case. It should be remembered that the DPR and the LPR declared their independence from Ukraine back in 2014. But we only recognize them now, despite the higher level of support for doing so, both in the republics themselves and in Russian society from the very beginning. At the time, the hope won out that the Ukrainian Maidan regime would think again and would stop talking to their own citizens in the east in the language of cannons and shooting and threats and shelling. Time and again, we firmly asked Kiev to listen to the aspirations of um, the people living in Donbass and the Russian-speaking residents of the country to respect their entirely legitimate desire to use their mother tongue and to teach their children in that language, and also to honor the memories of those who liberated the land from fascists rather than those who fought on the side of fascists and had a hand in the killing of hundreds of thousands, pe thousands of people during the Second World War. After... Ukrainian military adventures butted up against the determination of the people of Donetsk and Lugansk to defend their lands, the Minsk agreements were signed and the package of measures was adopted with the aim of implementing it. There was once again hope for peace and that the Maidan authorities would be sensible, having exhausted the desire to um, submerge Donetsk and Lugansk in blood. There was a particularly great amount of hope invested in the election in 2019 of a new president of Ukraine who promised at long last to establish peace in Donbass. However, those who hoped that the Ukrainian authorities would take a peaceful stance were unfortunately mistaken. Kiev not only very quickly returned to its bellicose rhetoric and continued the shelling of civilians, but also did everything it could to sabotage and ultimately destroy the Minsk agreements. And most importantly here is the flat refusal of Kiev to speak directly with the representatives of Donetsk and Lugansk, despite the fact that this requirement is a central structural element of the package of measures. An unambiguous confirmation of uh, an unwillingness to engage in that dialogue is something we've heard repeatedly from Ukrainian leaders in the last few days, including from the permanent representative of Ukraine during the Security Council meeting that we convened on the 17th of February to discuss the implementation of the Minsk agreements. After that, it became clear once and for all that Ukraine did not intend to implement the Minsk agreements, and I would like to recall and remind my colleagues on the Security Council that in all other conflicts, be it Libya, Syria or Yemen, we all demand and call for direct dialogue between the parties to the conflict. And it's only in Ukraine, for example, the Ukraine that is for some reason an exception to this rule. From some statements today, one may understand that a number of our colleagues are ready to bury the Minsk agreements. However, I would like to remind you that when the Minsk agreements were concluded, the LPR and the DPR had already declared their independence. The fact that Russia today recognized that in no way changes the makeup of the parties to the Minsk agreements because Russia is not a party to the Minsk agreements. We have repeatedly declared this, and in so doing, in this regard, nothing has changed. 
It's another matter that the Minsk agreements, part of the provisions of which were supposed to be implemented way back in 2015, have long openly been openly sabotaged by Ukraine with the backing of our Western colleagues. And today we can see that many colleagues want to um, sign up to the idea that the Minsk agreements are dead, but that's not the case. And Kiev is still bound to implement them. We remain open to diplomacy for a diplomatic solution. However, allowing a new a bloodbath in the Donbass is something we do not intend to do. Unfortunately, we are forced to note the extremely negative role played in all of this by our Western colleagues led by the USA. Instead of forcing Kiev to implement its obligations, they have merely been openly egging Ukraine on, repeating the uh, meaningless mantra that the obligations under the Minsk agreement are not being implemented by Russia, which, as we've repeatedly underscored, is not even a party to the Minsk agreements. Moreover, while uh, for the last few weeks already whipping up unfounded panic around the allegedly impending Russian invasion of Ukraine, our Western colleagues have been unashamedly cramming weapons into the country, sending instructors there, essentially nudging the Ukrainians who have con concentrated uh, an 120,000 strong military contingent along the contact line towards an armed provocation against Donbass. The joint efforts of the West and Ukraine have inflated an air bubble that simply had to burst. In the past weekend, there's been a sharp increase in the intensity of Ukrainian shelling in, uh, of uh, residential areas of LPR and DPR, and the um, uh, 100, uh, 1,600 shells have been shot, uh, civilians have been killed. The territory of the republics has been penetrated by subversive groups who have carried out or tried to carry out sabotage of critical infrastructure. As I already said, there are casualties from among the civilian population. Uh, the LPR and DPR have declared general mobilization. In, uh, it's in Russia and not Ukraine that refugees have flooded to. Uh, over the last few days, the number of evacuated women, old people and children has reached around 60,000 uh, people. And Russia is hosting them and providing them with conditions for them to be housed and supported. There has also been shelling of some uh, towns and villages on Russian territory near the border zone. And so it has become clear that Donbass is on the brink of a new Ukrainian military adventure, as was already the case in 2014 and 2015. We cannot allow that. That is why the Russian president heeded the opinion of parliamentarians and members of the Russian Security Council, and you know the rest, a detailed statement from our head of state about the reasons of this decision that has been taken was broadcast in detail by all the world's leading media. Today, it's true, we have heard an open distortion of what the president was talking about in his statement about history and the genesis of this situation and about the fact that he allegedly said that he wants to reconstruct the Russian Empire. Distinguished colleagues, I would like to call upon our Western colleagues to think twice, to set emotions to one side and not to make the situation worse. No one other than you can hold back the militaristic plans of Kiev and force it to stop the shelling and provocations against the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics, who in these new condition, which in these new conditions could have extremely dangerous consequences. In accordance with the agreements that were signed today and on the basis of their uh, requests from the Republic, peacekeeping functions on their territory will be carried out by the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Distinguished colleagues, in conclusion, I would like to note that in today's statements, most of you did not find any place for the more than four million of residents of Donbass. It's as um, though you've been counselling out their fates from your statements from 2014, generally um, calling them pro-Russian separatists. At the same time, We've decided that the illegal coup in 2014 only wanted to discuss with the new authorities how their rights would be upheld. That was all they wanted to do. In the last few days, with the sharp intensification in military uh, activity from the Ukrainian army along the contact line, the lives of hundreds of thousands of women, children and elderly persons have once again, as in 2014 and 2015, turned up uh, ended up un under real threat and the main aim of our decision was to protect and 
preserve those people. And that is more important than all of your threats. Thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to the Permanent Representative of Ukraine. Distinguished members of the Security Council, Under Secretary, it is with unease that I will now remove my mask. And it is not because of the COVID virus. We are all vaccinated. There are vaccines for COVID. It is because of the virus that has so far no vaccine, the virus that hit the United Nations, and the virus that is spread by the Kremlin. The delegation of Ukraine has requested this urgent meeting to draw the attention of the Security Council to the illegal and illegitimate decision by the President of the Russian Federation to recognize the occupied parts of Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine as so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Today, the entire membership of the United Nations is under attack under attack by the country that occupied the membership of the Security Council in 1991, bypassing the UN Charter. The country that occupied parts of the territory of Georgia in 2008. The country that occupied parts of Ukraine in 2014. As stated by the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, following the urgent meeting of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine have been and will remain unchangeable, regardless of any statements and actions by the Russian Federation. Ukraine unequivocally qualifies the recent actions by the Russian Federation as violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The political leadership of the Russian Federation shall bear full responsibility for the outcomes of the decision taken. Recognition of the occupied parts of the Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine may be considered as unilateral withdrawal by Russia from the Minsk agreements. And well, as it's disregard of the decisions taken in the framework of the Normandy fall. This step undermines peaceful efforts and ruins the existing negotiating frameworks. By the decisions adopted today and those that may be adopted tomorrow, Russia legalizes the presence of its troops, which have actually been in the occupied areas of Donbas since 2014, a country that has fueled the war for eight years is not able to maintain peace as it claims. What will happen next? We want peace and we are consistent in our actions. Today, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine has sent a request on the basis of the Budapest Memorandum to the guarantors of security of Ukraine, demanding immediate consultations. The meeting of the UN Security Council and the special meeting of the OEC have been initiated. We insist on the full-fledged oper operations of the OEC SMM to prevent provocations and further escalation. An emergency summit of Normandy 4 has been requested. 
we expect from our partners clear and efficient steps of support. It is critical to see now who is our true friend and partner, who is on the side of the UN Charter, and who will, be, who, and who will continue to deter Russia by words only. We are committed to a political diplomatic settlement and do not succumb to provocations. In accordance with Article 51 of the Charter, Ukraine has the inherent right to individual and collective self-defense. We are committed to a peaceful and diplomatic path, and we will stay firmly on it. We are on our land. We are not afraid of anything or anyone. We owe nothing to anyone. And we will not give away anything to anyone. There should be no doubts whatsoever. Because it is not February 2014. It is February 2022. Another country, another army, one goal is peace. Peace in Ukraine, peace in Europe, global peace. Excellencies, we must do all we can to make sure that the problem of Donbass is resolved through implementation of the Minsk agreements. That was said here in the Security Council chamber just four days ago, said by the Russian deputy foreign minister in the chair of the president of the council with a reference to President Putin. President Putin, who has taken a decision that we discussed today as a threat to the rules-based order, to the UN Charter, in particular, Article 2 of the Charter, as well as to international peace and security. Peace and security that the Council has been conferred a primary responsibility to maintain under the Article 24 of the UN Charter. And in accordance of the, with the Article 39, the Security Council shall make recommendations or decide what measures shall be taken to maintain or restore international peace and security. The delegation of Ukraine re requests the Security Council members to exercise the above duties. We invite the Russian Federation to reread again and again carefully today's statement where the Secretary General considered the decision of the Russian Federation to be a violation of territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and inconsistent with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. And I thank the Secretary General for this powerful statement. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that it remains up to Russia to abandon its long-lasting strategy on Ukraine based on threat and use of, of, uh, use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of my country and re-engage in what we all have committed to, fundamental principles of peaceful relations enshrined in the UN Charter. We demand from Russia to cancel the decision on recognition and return to the table of negotiations. We condemn the order to deploy additional Russian occupation troops in the territories of Ukraine. We demand immediate and complete ver verifiable withdrawal of the occupation troops. Dear members of the Security Council, the United Nations is sick. That's a matter of fact. It's been hit by the virus spread by the Kremlin. Will it succumb to this virus? It is in the hands of the membership. Today, the Kremlin copy-pasted word by word 
the decree on Georgia of 2008. Word by word, copy, paste it, copy, paste it. No creativity whatsoever. The copying machine in Kremlin works very well. Who is the next among the members of the United Nations? The question is open. I thank you. I, as President of the Security Council, am obliged to say this. I thank the representative of Ukraine for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Germany. Thank you, Mr. President. I start by thanking Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for her briefing. Mr. President, only four days after our last meeting, this Council meets again to discuss the situation in Ukraine. On Thursday, there was consensus in the Security Council that the Minsk agreements, which this Council unanimously endorsed by its resolution 2202, need to be implemented, including by the Russian Federation. Today, we are confronted with the very opposite from Russia. President Putin's decision to recognize the separatist self-declared People's Republics in eastern Ukraine is not only a blatant breach of Security Council Resolution 2202, but also of basic principles enshrined in the UN Charter. It is another flagrant and deliberate violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity after the illegal annexation of Crimea and the instigation and fueling of the armed conflict in eastern Ukraine since 2014. Russia has repeatedly insisted it was not party to the conflict. Today it unmasks itself and shows that it always has been. Mr. President, my government condemns Russia's violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. With our allies and partners, we will take firm and adequate measures in response to Russia's breach of international law that will have serious economic, political, and geostrategic consequences. And I call on all UN member states to join us in condemning Russia's actions of today. Today's decision comes in the context of an unprecedented buildup of Russian forces around Ukraine over the last weeks and months. <clears throat> These forces seem poised to attack. We have seen a flare-up along the line of contact over the last days and efforts that appear to fabricate a pretext for Russian attack. Moreover, Russia has declared its readiness to deploy troops in eastern Ukraine. The UN Charter is crystal clear. It unequivocally prohibits the threat of force against the territory, integrity and political independence of states. The current Russian force deployment around Ukraine can only be considered as a further threat against Ukraine's territorial integrity as a whole. Mr. President, President, I call on Russia to live up to its obligations as a permanent member of this, this Council, and I urge Russia to immediately revoke today's decisions and re recommit to the Minsk agreements, and uh, in line with the Normandy 4 and what was agreed on. Russia must not cross the international recognized borders of Ukraine. Moreover, Russia must immediately withdraw its troops from the regions bordering with Ukraine in Russia and Belarus. And I call on Russia to recommit to the rules-based security architecture in Europe, which has been built over decades. Russia's decisions have put this order under serious strain. We call upon Russia to instead return to the path of diplomacy, of shedding, uh, instead of shedding further blood and Germany will spare no diplomatic effort in this regard, while steadfastly standing by Ukraine, its territorial integrity and sovereignty and the Ukrainian people. Thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of Germany for her statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.